Good evening. My name is Marty Chen. I'm a research associate at the Harvard Institute for International Development, and I'm a lecturer here at the Kennedy School of Government. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all this evening to the opening session of a two-day symposium entitled Shaping the Policy Debate, the Role of Non-Governmental Organizations in International Development. These are times of tremendous change and uncertainty. The role of markets is being widely expanded, while the power of nation states is being widely challenged. In response to these challenges and uncertainties, there is an active current debate about the relative strengths and appropriate roles of states and markets. Increasingly, in some circles, these debates include a focus on a third sector, the non-governmental sector. While no panacea, non-governmental organizations can play vital roles in international development. The current symposium has been organized to highlight and analyze the role NGOs have played in shaping policy, both at the national and international levels. The Kennedy School of Government and the Harvard Institute for International Development are proud to welcome five NGO leaders from developing countries as the keynote speakers in the symposium. It is my privilege to introduce the moderator of tonight's session, who will in turn introduce our guest speakers. But before I do so, I would like to acknowledge the very hard work and financial support of many students and many student interest groups who helped organize the symposium and the financial support of several programs at Harvard University. For those of you who have a program, the um, groups that were involved both in organizing and providing financial support are listed at the back of the program. My thanks to all of you. I know how hard you've worked. In particular, I would like to thank Carol Grodzins, Alexandra Overy, Lauren Blackford, Mary Kay Gugerty, Nada Natarajan, Mia McDonald, and Dan Seaman of the International Development Professional Interest Council, IDPIC, of the Kennedy School of Government. I'd also like to thank Patricia Langan, Kelly Knight, and Liz Polanski of the Women in International Development Group, Ruth Junkin and Anne Wallenstein, or Wellenstein rather, from the Fletcher School of Diplomacy, and Kali Abdul Razak from HIID. But now it's my great pleasure to introduce John Evans. However, it's hard to know quite where to begin. Dr. Evans is by training a medical doctor, but his career has taken him quite some distance from the actual practice of medicine. He is currently the chairman of the board of the Rockefeller Foundation. He is also the chairman and chief executive officer of a biotechnology firm in Canada. Dr. Evans was the founding dean of the McMaster Medical School, where he helped introduce very innovative community medicine curriculum. He was also the president of the University of Toronto. And at some point, he moved south uh, from Canada and served as the director of health, nutrition, and population at the World Bank in Washington. Dr. Evans maintains active links with non-governmental organizations, both in Canada and internationally, through his work on the boards of the Rockefeller Foundation and several Canadian non-governmental organizations, including the African Medical Research Foundation. Finally, on a personal note, I had the great pleasure of accompanying John Evans and his wife Gay on a field visit to a very successful NGO in Bangladesh. And I know from experience, I know from watching him try to lower his great height under the doorway of a hut and sit uh, with his very long legs on a very low cot in this hut, uh, listening to a health worker, 
that John is a keen and informed observer of the work of non-governmental organizations. So welcome, John Evans. Thank you very much, Marty. Ladies and gentlemen, this, uh, uh, the very important part of this forum, of course, is your opportunity to ask questions to these uh, five people after they've had a chance to make their uh, preliminary statements. When Marty introduced me on a previous occasion, uh, she said many of these things, and the wise observer uh, sitting next to her uh, in Bangladesh said, this man obviously has had difficulty holding down a job. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Our uh, first speaker is uh, uh, Maria Allegretti, uh, founder and president of the board of the Institute of Amazonian and Environmental Studies, a non-governmental organization which is dedicated to research and technical advice on en environmental issues. Ms. Allegretti did research for her master's degree in anthropology in the Amazon forest of Acre province in northern Brazil. When she arrived, she was confronted with the plight of the rubber tappers who have lived throughout the northern jungle region of Brazil since late in the last century imported there by large landholders to extract rubber from uh, the region's rubber trees. These people were faced with economic destitution and displacement as a result of the intense development pressures uh, facing the entire Amazonian jungle region. Ms. Allegretti has worked to help the rubber tappers and the jungle they inhabit to survive into the next century. Her work has led from adult education to the Rubber Tappers Union, a new national concept called the Extractive Reserve, and a research institute creating economically viable paths towards sustainable development. Ms. Allegretti is a fellow of both Ashoka Innovators for the Public and the Inter-American Foundation, a recipient of the Worldwide Fund for Nature's Gold Medal, and a winner of the Global 500 Award from the United Nations Environment Program. She is also a member of the Dante Fassel Fellowship Program. Marie? Well, I'd like to thank first for the HIAD and Marty Chen for the invitation to come here and for this opportunity to talk to you about my work. I'd like also to ask you to excuse my English. And the time is so short, so what I'll do is to to suggest some important issues I think uh, it's important to discuss today and tomorrow. And I'd like to say also that I'm, not, I'm here also in name of uh, the Brazilian Forum on Social Movements and NGOs to Environment and Development, which congregate more than 1,000 organizations in Brazil. Well, in the, the, the first uh, issue, I, I think it's important to to talk about is in terms of uh, development in general, is to think about the role the NGOs can play. And I, I think four main areas or f four main objectives, uh, it's important to, to think at uh, a f one uh, first uh, approach. The first one is that the uh, NGOs has a very important role in the process of democratization of the access of international resources, financial and technical resources for local communities in many parts of the world. I think this is a very important uh, role played by NGOs in uh, with many different experience in many 
parts of the world. The other important role is to influence public policies in the direction of a socially, economically, and environmentally equitable society. The third role is to implement concrete examples of development under community management, trying to show to government that it's possible to change the uh, process of development. In the last one, it's to fight for a new ethic in the relationships between rich and poor countries. I think this four roles has been uh, implemented by NGOs in many countries and could be our point of depart. But I think I, I need to, to say that, uh, in my opinion, the contribution that NGOs can make to development cannot replace the role and the responsibility to be played by the state in providing basic needs for the people. So is the duty of the NGOs to develop strategic projects capable of generating public policies that may benefit under the responsibility of the state large population continent, con uh, large population contingents. Uh, uh, it, I, I think this is very important to not to, to uh, confu uh, conf not to uh, to to have different roles and different positions, NGOs and the state, not to replace the position and responsibility, the responsibility of the state. Well, these are um, lessons for my experience as an NGO in the Amazon. And in base of this experience in the Amazon, I think there's a very important uh, way to change development and to change policies for the development when we are able to combine different actors, strategic objectives, actions in different levels, and political alliance. And I will talk about this in base of my experience in the Amazon uh, in a uh, two or three minutes. Uh, what this means, uh, when to, to influence the development, we need to work at the same time at local, national, and international level. We need to have, at the same time, uh, the work with local communities, NGOs, researchers, the university, and official governments. We need to have political alliances between local communities and NGOs at national level and international level. And this kind of uh, alliances could provide uh, new uh, conditions for development. And in the case of the Amazon, in the case of, of my experience, it was exactly this kind of combination that permits to us to uh, have some success trying to change the, uh, the model of development in the Amazon. Uh, as you know, the Amazon in last, the last 10 years uh, have received many uh, uh, different uh, attention in the world and in, because of the deforestation of the, fo the, the forest. But nobody knows that the deforestation of the, of the, the rainforest in the Amazon uh, means also the uh, expulsion of local populations. Uh, rubber tappers, Brazil connectors, riverines, these people are living and using the forest for many decades. And when the farmers the, uh, from the south of Brazil went to the Amazon, trying to, to uh, use that land to uh, pasture, uh, many, many families were uh, threatened and exposed uh, to the cities. And for many years, the rubber tappers organized in unions tried to defend themselves 
and against the deforestation. Not because of deforestation means uh, uh, the uh, an environmental problem, but also because deforestation me means to them uh, to have to lost their uh, conditions of life. So. For many years, the rubber tappers tried them by themselves to defend their habitats and without success. Uh, uh, when the NGOs and the Institute uh, for Amazonian Studies and many other NGOs started working with the rubber, the rubber tappers, the first thing we uh, did was to try to transform the uh, demands of the rubber tappers in public policies. What this means? Uh, the rubber tappers decide to stay on the forest and decide to remain on the forest and to live there. But at the same time, they were all the time asking better conditions of life. So we tried to uh, establish a relationship between a local demand and a, a, the national policy of environment, saying that uh, it, it would be most uh, interesting to have people uh, taking care of the forest and people living in the forest and uh, adding value to the forest than to have uh, poverty in the cities. And we have uh, achieved very uh, good results because in three or four years, uh, as a result of this alliance between local communities, researchers, NGOs, and with the, uh, the big support for uh, international environmentalists, we uh, have now uh, uh, 3 million hectares of protected forest for local communities. This means 1% of the Amazon region. And we have also a public policy specifically related to sustainable development. And this public uh, uh, policy is uh, being implemented by the Brazilian government together with uh, representatives of this movement. So uh, I have no <laughs> time more. So uh, what uh, it's, uh, the, the, le the lesson of this experience is that when we uh, provide access to natural resources, we provide at the same time conditions to uh, influence the public policy. When we provide access to natural resources and financial resources and technical resources to the society, we can at the same time uh, provide and uh, conquest uh, social and political power. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marie. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Peter Ann Baker who is coordinator of the Associate Association of Development Agencies in Jamaica. She is also a lecturer in social planning and project implementation at the University of the West Indies and uh, a television current affairs commentator. She is the only one who will really feel at home under the spotlight uh, here. She serves on the board of the uh, Canadian Development Agency, CUSO, the Jamaican National Planning Council, the Commission on International Affairs of the World Council of Churches, and a number of other very significant uh, committees. She has extensive experience with policy development and coordination, the media, formal and informal education, and human rights protection. She's coordinated the Jamaican Council for Human Rights. She has served on the executives of the Jamaican Association of Social Workers and uh, was an official observer for the 1980 elections in uh, Guyana. She's written uh, extensively on topics uh, such as the non-governmental uh, organizational perspective on strategies for transformation and alternative development, government NGO collaboration, and Jamaican entrepreneurs. Now, Ms. Baker has a social work uh, degree from the University of the West Indies. And uh, while on a Commonwealth uh, scholarship, uh, she uh, received the MPhil degree from the University of Sussex uh, in England. You down? I have unfortunate news for John. When I'm doing my commentaries, however, 
there isn't anybody in the studio besides myself on the teleprompter. <laughs> so I think we will have to journey together on this one. And unfortunately, too, I have been robbed of all of my popular education um, methodologies, and I'm restricted to the more formal methodologies. But that does not stop me from thanking the, the Kennedy School of Government and the Harvard Institute for International Development, as well as the Student Professional Development Council for having me here. I don't thank you for only giving me 10 minutes, but <laughs> we'll try. Um, what I want to, to try and share with you, because at heart I'm, a, I'm an organizer, um, and so what I want to share with you is an example of a particular strategy that we have tried to use um, in our policy work in the Caribbean. And in this regard, I'm wearing two hats um, because I am the coordinator of the Association of Development Agencies, which is an um, a Jamaican umbrella organization. And Ada is a founding member of the Caribbean Policy Development Center. And it is really the experience of the CPDC in its absolutely formative stages that I want to, um, to share with you to see what lessons we might extract um, about shaping the policy debate. And I think one of the, the first things I would want to say about the strategy that we use is that our work in the policy arena, both CPDC and ADA, is rooted in the issues and the, the concerns and the problems that our members are dealing with in the field. It's not um, based on um, somebody else's conceptualization of what the issues are, but that we come to a policy issue based on an analysis of what are we doing, what are the problems, why are we encountering these problems, what is the macro um, context um, that frames these problems, and therefore how do we tackle it. So what I want to talk about is, is this approach that we have been evolving. And to give you a little background, what, what was happening is that in the mid-80s, a number of us, both individuals and organizations, had been participating in making representations to various official organizations. A number of us, for example, had appeared um, as members of an expert panel in front of three United States congressional missions which visited the Caribbean um, over a period of, of two years at the invitation of the Development Group for Alternative Policies. And out of that exercise, we began to discuss among ourselves how we needed to take an independent and indigenous initiative that dealt not only with, say, the US Congress, but which also dealt with our own governments. Now, parallel to that internal discussion that was happening, our own heads of government organized into the Caribbean community, CARICOM, decided in 1989 to organize a tripartite regional economic conference. And their approach to that was to use the classic model, which is government, private sector, organized labor. Um, however, to our good fortune, perhaps to their misfortune, they decided in addition to invite onto the planning committee a representative of the Association of Caribbean Economists and a representative of the Women and Development um, unit at the University of the West Indies. Now those two people were connected to our networks and were aware of the discussions and in fact had been part of some of the interventions we'd been making earlier. And therefore the decision was taken um, because ACE and WAND were not invited as NGOs. They were invi invited because you had a set of economists and we wanted to deal with women's issues. But they decided to use their position in that planning committee to help to open a space for the NGO sector per se. And we, we agreed then to dovetail the emerging um, or the emergence of this, this entity which ultimately became the Caribbean Policy Development Center with our efforts to get into this tripartite CARICOM Regional Economic Conference. And we had agreed that the mission of the CPDC was putting people at the center of a Caribbean vision. Um, and that the strategy we were going to use 
was to try and strengthen the capacity of the participating organizations in the CPDC to make their own interventions. And so over a one year period between 1990 and 1991, we did a number of things. Um, the participating organizations, for example, tried to find out what was happening in terms of preparations in their own countries. And that was a very interesting experience. The first time we called our Ministry of Development and Planning, for example, they said, what conference? Um, and when we insisted, they said, well, we don't know anything about involvement with NGOs, but we persisted. Um, however, some of the other agencies in the other territories were not so successful. Um, and in fact, it was only in Jamaica that we were able to secure participation not only for ADA but for a number of other NGOs in preparatory meetings which were in fact held six months prior to the conference um, and to in fact have the NGO critique inform the Jamaican government policy document which was subsequently submitted to the document, to the, to the conference. Um, in addition to that, we were the only delegation, the only official delegation that had official representation from the NGO sector. And we had representatives of ADA, we had a representative of the umbrella organization of women's organizations in Jamaica, we had a representative of the um, organization of informal sector producers. At a regional level, the fledgling, and we have to remember this because you're talking about events that are happening simultaneously over a 12 month period, um, and, and you know, an organization is being formed even as it is implementing what its mandate is. Um, and so that at a regional level, CPDC working with WAND and AST lobbied the CARICOM secretariat to secure also accreditation and the right to speak in this conference because you can be allowed to be there and you sit on the sidelines. Um, and that was very important given the difficulties we were having at the national level to secure representation. The outcome of that was that instead of one or two NGO representatives, which is what was originally envisaged, we had 13 NGO leaders accredited to and making submissions at the Regional Economic Conference. Um, and in addition, one of the member organizations of CPDC, a popular theater organization, was invited to make a, a popular theater presentation as part of the opening ceremony on youth concerns and issues. And finally, CPDC played a very important role in maintaining the communication, in, in convening regional meetings from time to time um, to help us to hammer out a position. What was the outcome of all of this? We had set ourselves some very specific objectives. We didn't expect to change the course of Caribbean development in one year. We were trying to get to say it is legitimate for us to be in a regional policy making forum like this one. We accomplished that. The, the, the Port of Spain communique said NGOs are an important part of our democratic process. They must be here. Governments must take steps to also secure them a place in their own national policy making. Um, secondly, we were able to give expression to our own particular uh, point of view because the official conference document, for example, was very economistic and very production and trade related. Something like debt and structural adjustment, for example, got two lines in a document that ran to over 100 pages. We said that cannot work. The issues of debt and structural adjustment are central to the crisis in our region and require the mobilization at a regional level. That also, that point of view and perspective was accepted and reflected in the documentation. And thirdly, we said having a two-day regional conference is not enough. This discussion and debate must continue. That too was accepted and, regional, and a commitment was made to reconvene the conference on a, on a triennial basis. Some quick lessons. First of all, I think it's very important as we, we equip ourselves um, to, to shape the policy debate, to have very clear expectations and to have very clear objectives and a plan of action. I think we, we sometimes get a little idealistic and utopian about what can be accomplished in what period of time. 
Secondly, I think it's very necessary, particularly if you're going to be operating in networking situations, that we have to be prepared to subordinate individual interests, individual organizational interests, to a common, to the development of a common agenda. ACE and WAND, for example, could have clung to their privileged positions on that planning committee. And even if we had decided separately from them that we had wanted to proceed, it would have made our job that much harder. Some other components, division, a clear division of labor, we weren't all doing the same thing, ongoing communication. And also, I think we won support for our positions because we were prepared. We had done research, we had done analysis, we had taken the time, and we weren't speaking simply on the basis of emotion or anecdotal evidence. Um, I would love to be able to tell you some more, um, particularly about the other component of the strategy, which has to do with the formation of opinion leaders at community level. For that, you will have to come tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and we found that they were the poorest of all the types of workers. Many of them are artisans and have become totally unemployed because they are not getting raw materials or they are not getting markets. And of course, since they don't exist, there is no protective legislation for them either. So when we first started organizing them, we organized, they became members of our union and we went to the labor department and we said, you know, these people are earning barely one rupee a day. So uh, why don't we try to give them some protection? And the labor department said, oh, well, they are not really workers. They are only housewives and they are doing it in their leisure time. We heard this. I mean, I am sick of hearing housewives doing in their leisure time. You hear it again and again. Um, so then we really started organizing them. And what we realized was, <laughs> what we realized was that um, it's not something that you have can deal with only at the grassroots level. It is much higher level of uh, um, policy that is required. Um, since we were a trade union, we first approached the trade union federations, the labor movement. Um, and the first reactions were very negative. This is around the end of, say, 79, 80, 81. We went to trade union federation meetings and at the national level. And we represented about home-based workers, and we got very negative reactions. When some, uh, we came on the stage like this and talked about home-based workers, the next speaker who would follow would say that uh, these women are, they are only housewives. Don't bring such frivolous questions to the floor. And at the international level also, we, had represent, we were members of the international trades uh, committees. And where we represented there, we were told that this is not, we didn't even get to the floor because there is this committee which decides what questions come in and they said this is not important because the uh, International Federation has decided that uh, home-based work should be banned and therefore they don't exist. <laughs> so we started trying to make linkages and strategically we found that the best linkages we could make were with the women's movements and both in our country where it was expanding, women's movement was expanding, and women's movement were very open for all the different types of issues of women, especially the invisible point, it points about invisibility. And abroad we found that the Dutch and the English somehow uh, had already started organizing their own home-based workers, but only the women, not the trade unions. So we maintained linkages. In the 1980s, there was a massive change because of this uh, economic restructuring that was going on all over the world. And the European trade unions suddenly found that in the European trade unions, which are very powerful internationally, suddenly found that uh, many of their workers were out of jobs and suddenly there was a big rise of home-based work and home working. And they began taking notice of it. And uh, first the International Trade, uh, the International uh, Garment and Leather Workers Federation, they first time brought it into a committee that home-based work is on the increase and then the International Federation of Food Workers brought it into their committees. Um, at the same time, at the national level, though home-based work was not actually increasing in India, but that was more because of our work and the support of the women's movement, the trade union federations began starting talking at least about the home-based work. At this time, the ILO, the International Labour Organization, they approached us and they said that you know, people are now beginning to talk about home-based work, so why don't you do a project on home-based work? So we said, all right, and we took um, a project, which means we took some of the money and we organized <laughs> women, which we were doing anyway, but we organized them more. <laughs> and, <coughs> and the advantage of that was that all the things that we wanted to say, which was that women are working at home, that they are invisible, that they need legislation and so on. That all went into the ILO system and it began, started being reproduced in sort of important international forums and in those, um, uh, you know, those uh, resolutions and statements that ILO brings out. Meanwhile, the international federations also, partly because the women in the European women's movement who are quite strong, they began influencing their trade unions and partly because of this economic restructuring, you know, this massive change, um, <clears throat> they began passing resolutions. And I think the turning point came in 1988 when the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions, which is the basic umbrella uh, of trade unions, passed a resolution. We drafted that resolution, passed a resolution in Melbourne 
uh, very strong resolution asking for international standards for home-based work, uh, asking all their affiliates to organize home-based workers, and asking for national laws. At the national level, also a lot had begun happening. Um, our general secretary became the chairperson of a commission on self-employed women and brought out an important report which called for a law on home-based workers. On the basis of that, a bill was introduced in parliament. And so this was a turning point. In the 1990s, <clears throat> things began slowing down a little bit. Firstly, um, I mean, nothing that dramatic happened, but it really began to spread. At the international level, the ILO, on the basis of our project, began a number of other projects, in, especially in Southeast Asia, um, and uh, a, a little bit in Latin America. Um, a number of international meetings were organized at the international level, um, at, I think, the uh, European Economic Community, Commonwealth, uh, citizens, then in the US, the Association of Women in Development organized on home-based workers. There was an international research um, uh, committee set up and so on. Um, and uh, a number of us, of organizations working with home-based workers, got together and set up what we call the International Campaign on Home-Based Workers, which is centered in Holland right now. In, in the ILO, as a first move towards the standards, an expert committee on home-based workers was set up, and that gave a number of recommendations, stopping just short of recommending a standard, because now that we had got the labor on our side, we began facing a lot of opposition from the employers' um, uh, organizations, associations. At the national level, uh, unfortunately, because of our political turmoil, we had three changes of government, and so the bill, which was on the verge of being passed, did not get passed, not because it wasn't it had much opposition, but because of the change. The trade unions in India are now quite committed to the uh, a law for home-based workers. Um, I wish I could end on a note saying that, you know, now we have a standard and now we have a national law. We don't have either. But uh, what we do have is a growing campaign. We have an international awareness, and we have the support of the labor movement. So now the next step is to try and organize so that the governments begin to support us, um, because uh, the third stage will be the employers. Um, just uh, the point, last point I want to make is that getting change for the very poor, that is for the powerless, is a very, very long drawn out process, I think, I believe. This has already taken nearly 12 years, no, 15 years, and I think we can look forward to another 15 to 20 years. So I think that the one lesson we've really learned is that if you want to influence public policy, you have to have a very strong grassroots movement and a lot of patience. Thank you. Not many people can pack 15 minutes of content into eight minutes. That was a really tremendous, uh, no, no. Our next uh, speaker is Ezra Mbagori. Mr. Mbagori is the executive director of the Ndugo Society, a Kenyan NGO that promotes urban community development projects, including work with uh, street children and women. Mr. Mbagori also chairs the NGO Network Standing Committee an umbrella organization of NGOs in uh, Kenya that has been active in promoting the interests of NGOs in response to recent government legislation uh, which uh, addresses the regulation of these organizations. Before coming to Ondugu in 1988, Mr. Mbagari worked as a consultant to various NGOs holding uh, several positions in Avada, the Voluntary Agencies Development Association, and uh, working for CRS, the Catholic Relief Services. He holds uh, an honors uh, degree, bachelor's degree, in education from Kenyatta University College. Ezra Mugari. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, like my uh, colleagues who've spoken before me, I want to echo the appreciation and to say that I feel very privileged to be here. Um, now, 
I know that Kenyans are renowned for fast running. In fact, a Kenyan won the marathon just the other day. Um, <laughs> yes, I agree with <laughs> But I um, would like to say that I probably am not quite as fast um, or as, as good um, as my colleagues in trying to pack as much as I'd like to say. So um, a bit like um, uh, Pete and I will probably have to say as much as I can now and leave the rest for tomorrow. Um, what I'd like to do, I'm a practitioner and would like really to spend the uh, few moments that I have telling a story about um, some of the things that we've been able to do in the Undugu society um, on <clears throat> uh, aspects of policy that relate to needs of communities that we work with um, and uh, try and bring out of those some of the lessons that we've picked up, but also ways in which uh, we've been able to shift the thinking of policymakers in Kenya. The bulk of uh, Undugu society's work um, really constitutes of social experiments, experiments uh, which we carry out to try and achieve uh, certain shifts or to meet the needs of uh, very, very poor communities in slum areas where we work. We established a presence in um, the slums of Nairobi, in, in a few particular slums in Nairobi, uh, in 1980, having worked for more than five years on the streets with uh, street children and having discovered from uh, this work that we needed to be more consciously addressing the root causes of their being on the streets rather than simply trying to um, rehabilitate these kids, which really uh, amounted to um, uh, simply band-aiding the problem. Once we established a presence uh, in the slums, we began to challenge the communities that we were working with to tell us what their most uh, urgent needs were. And then uh, in 1983, uh, after we'd been doing this, challenging communities to articulate their needs to us, um, there was a fire in one slum setting, and the community members, the leaders of that community, came to our offices, which were based in that area then, and uh, said very clearly, well, you always ask us what our primary needs are. Well, right now it's shelter. We don't have shelter, because all the shelters had been raised to the ground. What we um, did then, was engage them in a discussion about how best to address that problem. We first of all knew that all these shelters that had been burnt were <clears throat> themselves built on, um, on public land. They had been squatters. And that the land tenure problem is one that we could not possibly begin to address. Um, we also knew that an attempt to build shelters like they had before uh, would amount to basically um, the legal construction of housing. And besides that, that there is no way we could ever afford, together with the communities, to put up shelters that uh, in any way approximated the building code, even if the land tenure problem was, was addressed. So the dilemma that we had was that of resolving the gap between what the community wanted and both the land tenure problem and the building code. What we did is, uh, in uh, contact with this, this particular community, we established a strategy which we hoped would reinforce their confidence. We first of all decided that we would ignore both the land tenure problem and the question of the building code, <laughs> and that we would try and provide uh, support to their own efforts to build whatever structures they could, so long as we could uh, encourage them to build something a little more hygienic, something that addressed their health needs as well, and something which could then be upgraded with time. We underwent then what you know we boast these days as an exercise of planning a slum, and actually put up um, rural standard housing in the city, um, we, you know, in which we, first of all, encourage the community to contribute what they could, and we offered to also invest in this effort um, on the understanding, the joint understanding, that if these shelters were demolished by the local authorities, then both parties would have lost out. And so um, we would all understand that 
there is an oppressor who is greater than all of us. Um, we went ahead and actually constructed something like 300 shelters, uh, rural standard housing. Um, and <clears throat> at the end of this, this whole exercise, uh, then made contact with the local administration and requested, who, who subsequently requested that we help them with the relocation of another settlement from private land onto public land. Um, we agreed to do this as Undugu Society, to go ahead and help with this relocation, largely because we felt that that, in a sense, was, was um, giving credence to the initial exercise that we'd been involved in. And we then, at this stage, began to engage the community in uh, a process of upgrading of the shelters that we had uh, worked with them to put up in the first instance. Then comes 1987, the International Year of Shelter for the Homeless, after we'd gotten into this series of exercises for something like five years and had put up something like uh, 800 shelters uh, with these relocations. And at that stage, we saw an opportunity. We simply went to the, we, we sought um, some sort of space in the conference, the Habitat Conference that took place during that year. And um, sought or tried to encourage some of the international delegations that came to that conference to ask the question of the government, uh, the Kenyan government, regarding what they were doing to shelter the homeless. Um, at the same time as asking them to try and get some idea or some commitment from the Kenyan government about their role in sheltering the homeless, we turned around and talked to government officials and advised them that since we knew they did not have any suggestions for how to shelter the homeless, they were welcome to come and show them these shelters that we had worked on uh, with communities as examples of what could be done to shelter the homeless. Um, it worked. On that one occasion, it worked. The uh, government authorities who were pressured to show what they were doing to shelter the homeless went ahead and brought different delegations to see the uh, projects that we had been involved in with communities and actually gave communities an opportunity to talk about uh, their attempts to achieve shelter which was within their own means. Uh, again, this gave tacit approval to the sort of things that we were doing. Um, over time, we were, this way we were able to acquire a little more uh, acceptance of both this strategy, but also to interest multilaterals in that strategy for uh, securing shelter for, for very poor people. And um, this has gradually gained currency to the extent where the several uh, multilateral agencies began to talk to government, to our government, about the possibility of uh, expanding the, the whole concept of uh, slum upgrading and actually providing services to slums. Of course, we had a role in trying to get uh, these agencies to understand that these are areas of policy which we really had very, very little leverage over and trying to get them to exert their own influence in um, uh, securing or their own influence over the government in this regard. Today, in this one project setting, there is an area that has a total of 1,200 shelters that are fully serviced on account of the gradual currency that this strategy has gained and the acceptance uh, in principle of the government that there is a need, that there is no other way to provide shelter for the homeless except through um, incremental uh, improvements which involve communities. Um, and besides that, the, the principle of upgrading has gained currency. The community itself is very, very actively involved in the process of, of securing additional or undertaking additional activities that improve their livelihood in these settings. And um, Undugu, uh, as an organization, has been involved or has been asked to participate in several policy level committees to do with uh, the provision of shelter for very poor people. In fact, we have taken a role, uh, we played a role in uh, the development of policies around uh, not just slum upgrading, but also which have begun to 
talk about the whole question of land tenure and how to deal with the question of um, uh, housing and uh, the review of the building code in the city. We see this as one demonstration of uh, a role that NGOs do play often, which is that of trying to seize opportunities um, over time as they do their work, um, with, within which they can uh, input uh, extremely uh, critical insights regarding what changes could make life a little easier for communities, for poor communities, the, the kind that we work with. Um, I think I'll leave it there. I've been watching my time. Uh, thank you very much. Ezra, thank you very much indeed. Our final uh, speaker of the five is uh, Clement Nwankwo. Uh, Clement Nwankwo is executive director of the Constitutional Rights uh, Project in Nigeria. Uh, he's a lawyer. He's active in human rights issues in Nigeria and is the recipient of several awards and distinctions in this area, including the Human Rights Monitors Award from the Human Rights Watch in uh, New York. He is also a fellow of uh, Ashoka Innovators for the Public and a member of the Nigerian Bar Association. He has written a number of articles on human rights uh, and democracy, and he's co-author of the Bail Process and Human Rights in Nigeria, which was uh, published uh, last year, uh, and uh, The Crisis of Press Freedom in Nigeria, uh, published this year. He's editor-in-chief of the Constitutional Rights Journal. Mr. Nwankwo uh, received his Bachelor of Law at the University of Nigeria and graduated a barrister at law uh, from Nigerian Law School. Clement? Uh, firstly, I want to say thank you to the organizers of this program for um, having us over to uh, be present at this occasion. Um, when I got the invitation and uh, looked at the topic, which said the role of NGOs in shaping the policy debate, and I reviewed what we've been doing in Nigeria and the experiences we've had. Um, the experiences on being unwound sounded to me more like uh, how NGOs are frustrated in their <laughs> attempts at uh, playing a role in the policy debate. And I say this um, knowing that um, uh, you should at least have a background of the situation that I come from, which um, has not been a very uh, comfortable environment for the advocacy of human rights in Nigeria. Um, in 1960, Nigeria attained political independence from, from Britain, and since then, uh, the struggle for human rights and democracy in Nigeria has been a constant struggle uh, between, uh, between politicians and politicians, uh, between the military and politicians, and between the uh, military against the military in the area of uh, governance. Um, human rights has not or was not an issue in Nigeria for several years. Um, violation of human rights continued to be a problem until 1987 when the first human rights group in Nigeria was uh, set up. Uh, we have, between those periods, gone through uh, a lot of problems with uh, the politics and the democratic struggles in the country and most of the period uh, of political independence has been um, under uh, military rule. There has only been very um, 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 short interims of civilian administration in um, Nigeria. Um, the country, however, is currently operating a transition to civil rule program. Uh, the country has been implementing this program under the uh, government of uh, General Ibrahim Babangida since 1986. Um, this program has, however, witnessed several shifts, uncertainties, and arbitrariness. It's been shifted four times, and we're hoping that the final shift to August 27th will be a reality. Um, we're hoping it will be a reality because the role of human rights groups in Nigeria since 1987 has continued to be 
uh, strengthened and the determination of questions of rights and democracy has shifted significantly from entirely the arena of the military and their control of force to civil society. And human rights groups since 1987 have continued to play very significant role in the uh, struggle for human rights and democracy in, this, in, in Nigeria. And this has been helped, of course, by the vibrancy of the Nigerian nation, a country with more than 250 ethnic groups, very strong religious cleavages uh, amongst two major religions, uh, a very vibrant press, um, a very active and vocal uh, academic uh, community, students, and recently uh, human rights organizations, which have been very unyielding in recent times in the struggle for uh, democracy and uh, human rights in Nigeria. Considering the nature of government we have had, um, it is understandable why um, I would say that uh, the relationship between human rights groups and government in Nigeria has been very controversial, very confrontational, and very adversarial, uh, which is why I made the first comment I made that um, the, the, the question has been um, how the NGOs have been frustrated in their attempts to play a major role. But we have, with sheer courage and, um, uh, and unrelenting monitoring and criticism of the government's human rights policies and uh, democratic uh, experiments, been able to challenge uh, some of these uh, problems. And to fully comprehend the nature of problems we have and the role that we have played, uh, I would just give a brief background of the legal situation in Nigeria today. Uh, which is that we do not have a functioning constitution. Uh, laws are made by the military head of state who decides what laws should be made or not. Uh, to give you an example of the arbitrariness of laws that are made, I will just give an example of a law that was made about a month ago, which prescribed the leadership of the Nigerian Bar Association, of which lawyers belong to professionally, and which handed the running over of the Bar Association to a committee set up by government the committee made up of government appointees. And um, this body now has the right to determine who should remain a lawyer and who should not remain a lawyer. It also has the power to decide um, on who should be called as a lawyer and who should not be called as a lawyer. And the most, um, the most arbitrary draconian aspect of this law is uh, that it forbids you from going to court to sue this body not even to succeed in suing it, but for you as a lawyer to file a case in court with this body on a piece of paper um, would entitle you to a one-year jail term or to a 10,000 naira fine. But we have continued through our own work and through our own uh, challenges of this to, to work. We walk through two major methods, which includes litigation. Uh, we walk through research and publications. Um, part of the issues we have challenged um, through litigation is the constitution of uh, courts in Nigeria. The judiciary has been very, very unindependent and manipulated and controlled by government. Um, part of this control includes the setting up of military tribunals whose decisions are not challenged, and these tribunals are constituted by military personnel. Uh, we have, uh, in, 1980, in 1990, when we first challenged this composition, um, we um, we didn't go far because the law said you couldn't even challenge uh, the decisions of these tribunals. But through our court's actions and through our publications in the Constitutional Rights Journal, which we've been publishing since 1990, we finally got concession the, from the government. It, it was a concession. It wasn't any judicial victory, um, which resulted, of course, from the, um, uh, the shame that resulted from the publicity were given to this. The government removed military personnel from the tribunal, and in place of restricting judicial appeal against its decisions, it now set up a special appeal tribunal, which now had powers to review the decisions of this tribunal, now uh, constituted by a, a judge. We've also gone um, um, through the courts to challenge the situation in Nigerian prisons, which sometimes witness people staying in prisons for as long as 10 years without uh, trial, awaiting trial. Uh, we have been able to challenge consistently this continued violation of human rights, and uh, we have succeeded to a large extent in getting focus and attention paid on this, and government has responded by um, setting up committees to decongest this, uh, this, this, um, 
uh, prisons. We have also gone to look at other areas of freedom, including the areas relating to uh, press freedom, where we have challenged government powers to close down media houses arbitrarily and without challenge from authority, uh, from any quarters. We have challenged the torture of suspects in police custody. We have challenged different aspects of human rights violations. And we have at some point gotten concessions, not because the government uh, has responded to the courts or even that the courts have powers to adjudicate on these issues, but because of the sheer amount of publicity and uh, attention that we get to focus on this. There is the international dimension to all of this, which um, of course requires uh, or, or sees us going to uh, seek uh, publicity from the international arena to international human rights organizations and um, through um, governments that have the relationship with the Nigerian government. Um, but it hasn't even been very easy to go through that. The international arena is um, not very accessible to the local human rights organizations. The UN international, um, uh, the UN bodies which are responsible for monitoring uh, human rights violations and human rights issues are not accessible to local human rights organizations. And if you have to assess them, sometimes you have to go through international organizations based in Geneva and based in New York and so on. But that's not the way it should function. Human rights is very, very an, much an issue in the African continent. It's very much uh, abused and violated in the African continent. And it is my view that these bodies should be very, very easily accessible to, uh, to um, local human rights groups. Again, relationships between government and between international organizations has always been as between these organizations and government and government. It hasn't been between these organizations. The, the human rights is not a component of it. Um, NGO uh, groups in, in Africa and in, in, in most of the South are not a, a part of these um, relationships that go on. And these groups represent very, very large amount of oppressed and, and, and suppressed people across the continent. I, I guess my time is up, so I'll give up at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Clement. It's uh, great to see a lawyer engaged in productive activity. <laughs> We now uh, have uh, the opportunity uh, to turn it over to you, the, uh, the forum. You have heard five people who have been very disciplined in their presentations in time. May I ask you to, to do them the, and your colleagues the privilege of doing the same, to really make your questions questions, uh, not statements, if possible, and uh, to uh, keep them uh, brief so there will be opportunities for your colleagues. Will you line up at the microphones on either side, and I will uh, rotate back and forth between the microphones if the lines are, are there. Uh, each of the questioners will respond, at least of our panelists, will respond from their places because they all have microphones now, and I'll also ask them to keep their responses quite succinct to allow more of your questions. Sir. Yeah, uh, my question goes to Clement from Nigeria. Uh, I would love to ask you, Looking at African situation, where do you draw your strength from to combat uh, the government in Nigeria with respect to working on human rights? Secondly, how do you view your role with respect to the new uh, election to be held presently? But Magira is soon to be out of office. I can go ahead? No. Okay. <laughs> um, I draw my um, role and I draw my um, inspiration from um, my observation of uh, um, the situation uh, which obtains in different other countries in, in, uh, across the world and the situation in Nigeria. A lot of times people have said in relative terms maybe the situation in one country is better than the other. But for us, the situation has to be measured against the international standards which have been laid out in the international instruments. And we review the situation, we experience this. Uh, my first involvement in human rights was when I worked with the Nigerian prisons in 1986. And I had to go into the prisons to work at providing legal assistance to prisoners. I have had to see prisoners die before my very eyes. I've had to see prisoners who couldn't stand up while they were being interviewed because they had been in the prisons for seven, eight, some 12 years without trial. 
And a lot of times, those people cannot be prosecuted because, one, the witnesses are never available. The police officer who probably arrested him 10 years ago has either retired from service or is even dead. So you're never able to prosecute such cases. So the inspiration is in seeing people suffer so much and seeing that you could do something and that this is not an ideal situation. This is not the standards. This is not the way that things should be in a civilized society. So you want to challenge it. But in challenging it, you also have the problem that you are dealing with a government that is also ruthless, which is why I talked about the frustrations that we encounter in the work that we do. The government has been ruthless in the way it deals with critics. And I'm not talking of governments even in Africa alone. I'm talking of governments across dictatorships and governments that are intolerant of uh, criticisms. We have been arrested on a lot of occasions. We've been detained. We've had different propaganda in the media against us. But the inspiration comes from the fact that if you don't do anything, then you could be a victim one day. And you're not safe. Thank you very much. Uh, I think We've been playing a role since 1986, uh, since 1990, when we were set up, uh, and before then, uh, since we became involved in the human rights and democratic process in the country. We have continued to draw attention to the fact that it is wrong for the government to set up political parties and fund those political parties and draw manifestos and constitutions for those parties. We have continued to criticize most of the arbitrary laws that have been drawn up uh, by government. We have continued to criticize the flawed and arbitrary process that is leading up to the elections. We continue to draw attention both nationally and internationally to the defects in the lead towards the elections and towards the, the, the voting in June, hopefully, uh, this year. And we shall continue to do that. And in doing so, you've managed to stay out of jail, which is quite a <laughs> tribute in itself. Well, we move to this uh, microphone. Thank you. Um, this question is for Ms. Allegretti. Um, how do you see the relationship between the Brazilian NGO and the Brazilian government specifically? Um, how do you see the perceptions that they have of themselves and of each other as political actors? And basically, has this, these, have these perceptions changed throughout the transition to democracy? Marie? Uh, well, there's some change in Brazil the last uh, uh, two or three years. And the Brazilian NGOs is uh, changing also in their relationship with the government. But uh, the democracy in Brazil not necessarily means better uh, or a, a new uh, environmental policy. And uh, we are having really many uh, difficulties, not, not difficulties in terms of the, uh, to criticize and to be part of a process of the discussion, uh, the national discussion about environment. But the question is that the poverty in Brazil is growing so, so fast. So we have a, a, a dilemma that we are one of the most rich countries in terms of natural resources and one of the most uh, poorest countries in, ter in social terms. And now, the, for the angels, this is a, a so clear issue. And after the UNSAID, the angels in Brazil have, uh, the, have had the opportunity to debate a lot this relationship between uh, environment and development and social issues and, and environmental issues. And for the first time in many years, there are a new com national campaign now in Brazil, starting in Brazil now, and, by an, uh, and being uh, implemented by, by the NGOs, under the leadership of the NGOs, a national campaign against uh, poverty and hunger. And it's very important this because the government now is uh, saying that if the uh, Brazilian society, that the Brazilian society needs to do something. So for us, we are not waiting for the gover government. 
but it is clear that uh, we have some part in our, this problem and the government has another part. Uh, I don't think, think this could be a good solution because the structural problems are so complex. But it's better to work in democracy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Our next uh, question. My question is for the gentleman from Nigeria. Um, it's been covered a little bit, but I wanted to ask you to what extent you feel you're jeopardizing your own life and freedom by the work that you're doing. Um, what, if anything, you're able to do to protect yourself as you're doing it. Um, that was my primary question. I'm also interested if you wanted to discuss something about your understanding for the reasons for the difficulties with human rights violations in um, the African region, but that may be more than um, could be addressed now. I'll take the last one first. The difficulties with respect to human rights um, in the African region can be traced from the colonial history of most African countries. Um, the colonial history is replete with suppression of agitation, uh, national agitation or nationalistic aspir uh, aspirations by the colonial masters. Um, those who took over from the colonial masters um, only lent the, or inherited the um, strategies for suppression of freedoms that were left behind by the colonial masters, and they now began to apply it to their people. At the initial stage, the common enemy was the colonial master. But when the colonial master left, new masters took over, and they now saw themselves in the place of the colonial master, and the citizens as the subjects. It's an inheritance factor to some point uh, in that regard. Um, but we haven't gone much further than that since then. And we haven't gone much further because um, firstly, the Cold War came. Um, the, 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 those who took over from the colonial masters, some became very, very um, harsh dictatorships and were, in fact, supported um, for some geopolitical reasons, again, by the different arms of the Cold War. So the problem continued, and it's only recently that questions relating to democracy, human rights, and so on, has come to the fore uh, in, in the African continent. And it is only recently that people like Mobutu are now beginning to lose their friends. Uh, it's only recently that people like Yadema in Togo are beginning to lose their friends. Uh, because the Cold War is not there, the necessity for maintaining control over those regions no longer exists. And we do not have infrastructures, we do not have institutions that work in the African continent that are able to act as a control across borders on the question of human rights. Like you have institutions, the Inter-American Commission uh, or, or the, the European Court on Human Rights and so on. These institutions are not working in Africa. And at the international level, these institutions are not accessible to NGOs in Africa to um, um, continue to highlight um, the cases that are involved. On the question of personal safety, I, one of the reasons why I am happy uh, that I'm here is um, because I'm not an I, I think that uh, <laughs> to some point my presence here is a protection because then I am not seen to be walking in isolation. Uh, it is seen that um, this activist is known beyond the borders and so response to this activist um, is, is whatever action the government wants to take, they take it in line with the fact that this is not an isolated figure. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. um, I didn't mean to add to the ping pong between Nigeria and Brazil. Um, my original question was for Mary, in, uh, just for you to develop your point about the democratization of resources uh, between the, the role of NGOs, but other speakers addressed the cooperation between international and national domestic NGOs. So um, I just want to know more about how this cooperation is done and probably maybe the difficulties and advantages of such cooperation. So. I think it's very important, the uh, international cooperation 
with national and local organizations in developing countries. Uh, but I, th I think it's very important to know how, when uh, to do this kind of cooperation. Because, uh, for example, there are some uh, responsibilities that uh, must be our responsibilities. And we cannot uh, be out of our place. And there are some responsibilities that can uh, be uh, shared with international govern, uh, NGOs. So in, uh, my, in my particular opinion, I think if you, if the NGOs, the international NGOs are in their place, for example, doing pressure or information, sharing information, or uh, access to technical and uh, finance, financial and political support. It's uh, uh, their position as a part partner. Because in some aspects, in the international NGOs in some countries try to replace our work, and it's not possible. Uh, the challenge we have in our countries is, is uh, a challenge that we need to do with the support and the part partnership and the cooperation. Because the EU also has lots of challenges in your countries. <laughs> so uh, it's very important to know uh, because in many, many debates, the NGOs ask to us, how can I go and help you? But if you uh, work in your country also, you can do lots of things. And if you are, um, if you are in, in sharing with us the same objective, well, we'll mm -hmm. all uh, probably be, uh, have uh, new things in the future. Thank you very much, Bri. I'm sorry, my question is also to Ms. Aluagetti. Well, it's somehow, I'm the, uh, somehow if related. If you excuse me, can I ask you just to? Uh, I'll, I'll ensure that you get your question in, but I'd like to bring in some of the other panelists. Would you mind deferring to one, a panelist who is going to play come on to one of the other uh, members? Yeah, my thank you very much. That's very kind of you. My question goes to Renana, who is visible herself. I wonder how she represents invisible people, and uh, the invisible people tend to be illiterate. How do you get to? work together with them and voice their concern. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, let, should I answer? Please do. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me try and understand what the question was. I think what you're asking is why does a person who are, how do people who are illiterate and invisible, and how do we who are visible and literate work together in these issues, or how do the issues work together? Uh, I just want to give the experience of how, uh, what we have found in our own organization, which is that uh, what we have tried to do is make uh, a mix of people who are literate, who have certain professional skills, and uh, work with the, mem with the women who are not literate and who don't have certain professional skills. Um, the way that the organization is uh, constructed uh, is that it, being a trade union, the members are all only self-employed women. But, uh, and the main elective body, that is the main decision-making body, is of the self-employed uh, women, with a exception of two or three people uh, who the self-employed women are free to elect. But they then employ a large number of women, main, mainly women, we don't employ many men, women who have professional skills. For example, we have a uh, women's cooperative bank, which is uh, run by professional managers, which are employed by the board, which is of uh, self-employed women. That is one thing. A second thing is also that one of the main attempts that we have been making is that from among the self-employed women, they're younger girls who are getting educated, that they are the ones who should be drawn more and more into the running of the organization. Because for running an organization, 
uh, you need literacy skills for running professional type of organizations that is like banks and cooperatives you do need certain amount of professional skills just one thing i should mention is that it you have touched a very important problem for having middle class women and uh, working class women poor women and middle class women working together it creates a lot of tensions and it is actually very difficult and we both and especially middle class women um, have to give up their sort of ideas of you know who they are and how important they are and self employed women also have to sort of adjust that yes these women are sincere they are coming to work so we do have um, quite a bit of uh, education in this mix of people working together thank you very much our next uh, my question regards um, the role of the West in, in the work that you do. And specifically, I'm wondering what people such as myself and other students here who have studied international development, um, what we can do to support the work that you do, number one, or to fulfill a niche that you cannot fulfill um, because of our status as being outsiders. And I'm wondering if, if each of you can address that in some way. I'm going to ask uh, Peter Ann and Ezra, perhaps, if they would begin the response to that question. I think maybe if we could pick up from, from the point that Mary started to make, um, which is that there are a number of, of roles for people, say, in North America, um, and, for example, specifically in the United States. Uh, one of those roles is in terms of accessing information um, which is available here, which is not available um, in the Caribbean or in Latin America or Africa or Asia. Um, I think another role has to do with uh, becoming part of, of the struggles here. Um, because, for example, for us in the Caribbean, if we take the question of debt, a, a very concrete issue, um, it is very clear for us that with the best will in the world um, and with the most productive um, workers and the most uh, committed private sector, the odds are we are going to be repaying debt for the rest until eternity. And it is therefore clear that we have to press forward with the question of debt relief. I, I don't believe in debt <coughs> forgiveness because we have not committed any offenses. Um, the, for countries like ours where the, the bulk of our indebtedness is to official financial institutions to whom debt relief is anathema, what is required is a political decision on the part of the shareholders of those multilateral financial institutions to change that policy position and to create a basis for debt relief. And those decisions, therefore, are taken by the United States Director on the board of the World Bank and the IMF, the Canadian director on the board of the World Bank, who in fact votes on behalf of the Caribbean. Um, it is taken by the directors of the board of the Inter-American Development Bank, which for Jamaica, for example, is our greatest bugbear. The IADB is Jamaica's largest donor and is in fact the most hard line of the multilateral. Um, and, I mean, we've had interesting situations where the IEDB has carried a position which even the IMF and the World Bank have not supported <laughs> or have found too stringent. So there is a substantial amount of political work which has to be done with the American public to inform them, to mobilize them, to get them to press their congresspersons, to effect those kinds of changes. Those decisions are not taken by the technocrats um, in the multilaterals. Those are political decisions that have to be taken at the highest level. And, and that is a substantial body of work 
particularly in, in a place like the United States, for I think a number of reasons. The United States has its own economic problems. The United States is the most indebted country in the world. Um, and, and so the, the, the preoccupation, for example, at this present time is with my immediate home. Why should I be worried about these strange people far away who wasted all of this money and don't know which end of the world is up? Um, so that there's, there's that reason. And there's, I think, the, the whole host of other reasons in terms of private sector, sorry, trade, you know, all of those kinds of interests. Because in fact, what we're looking at um, in the process of debt and structural adjustment is a reorganization of the way in which the world economy works. So I think there's a lot of work to be done there. For us in the Caribbean, we have a particular interest, for example, in, um, in people making connections with the Caribbean community here in the United States um, and translating that numerical presence into, into political power. Um, so we think there's that job of work that needs to be done. But all of those things have to be based on a kind of relationship which, in which we're prepared not just to hear each other, but, but to challenge each other to confront all kinds of assumptions and attitudes that have been embedded over, over many years in order to come to um, a working position and, as I've called it, a, a, an effective division of labor. So I think there's a lot of work to be done here at home. Thank you, Peter. And I'm going to ask, because we're running over our time now, I'm going to ask the questioners in about 20 seconds to state each of their questions, including the gentleman who is kind enough to defer. And then I'm going to ask Ezra to make his choice, which one of those questions he's going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm from India, and this question relates to the women working in the rural sector. You know that half of the women working in the agriculture sector in India, more than half are women. And uh, we have got a minimum wages act, and it is a well-known fact that they are not given the minimum wages. We learned in economics at Harvard that government should not fix minimum wages. Mm -hmm. It should be left to the market forces of demand and supply, and it should be allowed to reach the market clearing point. <laughs> so this runs contrary to what I learned here at, in economics at Harvard and what the government of India has done about fixing the minimum wages for women in working in rural sector. My question is, is it advisable to go with a prescribed minimum wages for rural women working in the agriculture sector? And if it is advisable, how to ensure them the minimum wages now that we have consistently failed over the years to ensure that? For those women who are trying to be self-employed but who have failed in spite of the integrated rural development program and a host of government programs we've introduced in the last decade because of sheer strong opposition of the established business group who make it a point to ensure that their efforts fail. I'm going to declare that a lecture now. No. Uh, <laughs> my question <laughs> is how Christian to ensure colleagues. the marketability of their products yeah. through trade union and how to ensure gainful employment to that. Got a good may short I question I there. That's may I read the Can we really try and make them short so we give Ezra a chance? What is the role of because local fundraising in shaping the future of your organizations? Terrific question, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a specific question for Ms. Baker. Um, I wondered, you outlined the role of Caribbean Americans and other Americans in influencing IMF, for example, policy, but I wondered what your prospects were in terms of influencing government policy in the Caribbean, particularly after what happened with Michael Manley's government in Jamaica and his efforts to deal with the IMF World Bank pressure. Thank you very much. Having observed the tendency of international or northern NGOs to fund or support indigenous NGOs that may um, have the best PR capability rather than those that are best at organizing on the grassroots level, what advice would any of you have for changing that situation for how we might influence northern NGOs to begin doing their homework more effectively in the field? Terrific question. My question is actually for Mr. Obagori. Um, mm. I'm wondering um, <laughs> what, if any, role international standards have played in your work, um, specifically the right to housing that's been codified in any number of international documents. 
Sir, I insist that you ask your question. <laughs> I don't believe in human I think, rights. I think I it's very late, and I will ask my question tomorrow. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very much. Now, Ms. McGarry. Can I choose one other than the one that I was asked? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, although I will, I will make a passing comment to it, but um, I am particularly attracted to the question of local fundraising, uh, the role of local fundraising in our organizations, because um, in, in relation to the other hat I wear, which is that of um, chairing a committee mm -hmm. <coughs> of uh, non-governmental organizations that have come together uh, to look at you know, the role of non-governmental organizations in the country, and particularly uh, which have been brought together by um, a common enemy, the, the, the government, uh, wh which uh, promulgated legislation that we were very um, uneasy about. We, we've been looking at um, what the prospects for our longer-term involvement in development is, and whether uh, the charge, for instance, that we are um, simply serving our foreign masters is, is genuine. Um, and this is usually applied more in respect to our almost entire dependence on external funding. Um, part of what we've, we've done, uh, in fact, just at the beginning of this year, we conducted a series of workshops aimed at generating a better understanding amongst ourselves regarding what the local resource base was and how we can try and tap that for our own work. One of the uh, factors that, uh, or one of the lessons that came very clearly to us is that we obviously have not tapped that resource base uh, effectively in the past, and we need to do that. But also the fact that um, there, is, uh, th th there is a level beyond which we cannot go in terms of depending on external resources for our work. A lot of those organizations that function in uh, the area of uh, the provision of social welfare play roles which are so dependent on external financing outside of their own operations that, um, and it's at levels which cannot really be generated internally. So we think that what we have to approach constantly is the mix between external uh, resource support and uh, what the use of what local resources we can uh, to, well, not just to supplement that, but to play, to, to, to be the bigger bulk of the resources that we have. Um, just to make passing comments on the question of uh, the role of international standards in, in housing and what we're doing. Um, in the same way as we ignored the city's building code, which is actually, um, which was drawn from an outdated uh, code from uh, British standards. What we've done is looked at uh, what we can try and approach in terms of acceptable building standards. Um, and we've drawn, of course, from, from say, uh, what we know to be international building standards, but we're also very conscious of the fact that one principal factor or ruling factor is the ability of communities to afford what it is that we uh, want to promote. And so, whereas we are conscious of what standards might be acceptable internationally, we are ruled by what, what communities themselves feel is within their means and what improvements we can, in an interactive process, try and approach over time. Thank you very much. And uh, I thank you for all your questions and remind you that our panelists will be with us for another 20 minutes in which you can perhaps take those questions informally to the panelist of, uh, of your choice. Uh, I think we've been very fortunate to hear uh, not only uh, terrific presentations, but great questions. Five themes emerged in my mind as I listened. One, that people locally have to be the center of sensible and sustainable development uh, processes. Outsiders can help, but they're no substitute for those in the center. And one of the great challenges that was mentioned is getting communities to express uh, their needs. The second is the need for pragmatic plans, plans that, in fact, uh, have realistic expectations, and there's some demonstration of implementation of those plans. That requires clear objectives and a plan of action. The third that came through again and again is that change is really a slow process. 
This is not for people who want to make a speech and then disappear. This is, requires sustained efforts. Uh, Siwa, uh, classic example, the shelter work, uh, the human rights issue, difficult, frustrating, even dangerous. Uh, this is not for those who are the weak of heart. It requires dedicated people and sustained commitment, sustained institutions that can follow through this process. That, in fact, individual NGOs play an extremely important role, but the enormous power of NGOs that find shared purpose and can express even a broader constituency, uh, not uh, so much uh, having their activities perceived as special uh, interest. And finally, that uh, the NGO process, uh, it's been noted, Marie mentioned, uh, access uh, to international resources. I think for me, the uh, message is, is slightly different. It's the models that NGOs developing under remarkably difficult circumstances in some of the poorest countries provide to those of us throughout the world, some of us who have vastly greater resources than they can even dream of, to try and deal with our problems as well. The lessons are so often coming uh, from microcredit, microenterprise, CEWA, uh, even human rights issues to help those of us understand more clearly the disadvantaged within our own populations. We're all greatly indebted to these five panelists for an absolutely superb forum. Thank you very much. Yes, we can go without the spotlight. Okay. <laughs>